All right, we're glad you're here today in the, in the metropolis of Stephenville, Texas. And if you don't know where this place is, shame on you, you should know. Just take your finger, put it in the middle of the, mat, at the center of the state of Texas, and you're, you're probably 20 miles from where we are. But we're glad you're here as far as the internet goes. And we hope this blesses to you today because we got a great story from the Bible that will bless your heart. And we got a good crowd today. We got some absent, but God is moving, and we're excited about that. And I ask you to take your Bible and turn with me, please, to the book of Mark, chapter 2. And we're going to be bouncing around between a couple of books in the um, New Testament here and uh, read a few verses and get up and preach a sermon that I hope is a blessing to you today. And uh, let's read a couple of verses or so in Luke, ch I'm sorry, Mark, chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and we're going to start here at verse number 1, and I'll kind of give you a little bit of uh, background of what's going on here in uh, Mark chapter 2, and verse number 1, and Mark says here, and again he, Jesus, entered into Capernaum, Capernaum, which is a little fishing village on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, and this is, this is where Jesus' hometown was, and that's where he found his fishermen, by the way, they became fishers of men. After some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, inasmuch as that there was no room to receive them, no, no, uh, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word of God unto them. All right, now we're going to be talking about a miracle that happened. And miracles, I love miracles. Now I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen God do a miracle before? Ever? Have you ever seen a miracle? Boy, I have. I'll tell you what, I sure have. And uh, I've seen God provide money for properties. I've seen God give, move in the hearts of people that own properties to give properties to our church. I've seen men that have given months and sometimes up to a year of time of their free time to work to build, to help build church buildings. That's what we did in South America. We didn't hire people to do it. We did it ourselves. That's a miracle because it was, it, was, uh, it was just miraculous how God provided the property, the materials, and the manpower to build. But I want to tell you another little story that happened. When I was a missionary, we were having in Santiago, Chile, now this was in 1985, they were having a lot of civil conflict, and it was almost like a civil war. And at nighttime, what had happened, the insurgents would bomb the utilities, and all the lights would go out. And so we had scheduled for this particular week a tent meeting at nighttime during a week in a little public park. All it was was just a, an area about the size of this, these two lots here with no, no dirt, just a few trees and just dirt. There was no, 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 no grass. We, put it, we had a tent, we put it up, and every night we had our services. And so this one particular night, they were going to have a major demonstration. So I got there, and uh, all of a sudden we're getting ready to start the service like we did today. And the lights went out. And I thought, oh, no, what am I going to do? So I went outside the tent, I looked around, and in our area, as far as I could tell, there was no light anywhere. No, no houses, nothing. And you know what? Right at that moment, our lights came on in our tent. Just like this. I go, what? So we had our service and preached. Several people got saved. And it was wonderful. And we said our amen, and we were getting ready to leave. And as soon as we were leaving, the lights went out in the tent. Everything else was pitch black. Now, I call that a miracle. How about you? Amen. All right. And not only that, <clears throat> but I, something happened uh, about a few months after that, when it was in the middle of the wintertime. Um, I witnessed a miracle that I never believed that I, that I would ever see happen. But it, and I've told the folk the story. I was driving down the street. It was a Saturday night. It was the day before Father's Day. And down in South America, that's wintertime. See, in June, it's wintertime. And their, their summer is, in, is at Christmas when it's hot. Can you imagine Santa Claus sweating in his suit and it's 100 degrees outside? It doesn't get dark till 10 o'clock at night. It's crazy down there. <clears throat> so anyway, I had my youngest daughter. She was eight years old. We were coming back from visitation. We'd been out knocking doors and talking to people about Jesus. And there were a lot of people out. The lights had been knocked out, you know, because it gets dark there. And uh, it's because of the demonstrations. And there's people everywhere, but I couldn't really see them. It was, you could tell there were people there. And there was this man standing up, kind of up, up the road a little bit. And I slowed down. 
Well, right before I got to him, he got off the curb and went down to pick up something, and I hit the brake. I ran over him. He was under the front wheel of my vehicle, and I thought, oh, great. I said to myself, stupid, why did you do that? You know? And then, but the truth is, it, it, it was, he just did it at the last second. I couldn't, you know, so you have to have time to, to react. So I thought, there's no, um, what, what are the things they used to haul cars away? <laughs> tow trucks. There were no tow trucks around. I'm thinking in Spanish. No tow trucks. And I thought, if there was, it'd take an hour for him to get here, you know, if you call him up. So I thought, what am I going to do? I thought, oh, I'll just put it in reverse and back up real slow. So I backed up, and there he was in a, in a pool of blood that I'd created. He wasn't moving. I thought he was dead. Of course, my, my daughter and I are both bawling our eyes out. People are coming around. What happened? What happened? You know? Long story short, the ambulance came. My hand's in the air. If I'm lying, I'm dying. The two ambulance guys got out. They opened the back of the door. They picked the guy up one on one side, and they threw him into the back of the ambulance like a piece of meat. I thought, he's dead. And I thought, what am I going to do? So we waited and waited and waited in the street. And I asked the sergeant, why are we waiting? He said, because if he dies, you go to this jail. And if he lives, you go to this jail. Long story short, I didn't have to go to jail because of God's providence. The man was operated on at midnight. The surgeon said, I've done all I can do. I went to the hospital after the surgery was over. I got to go there. And the surgeon said, I've done all I can do. A lost person. Lost Chilean man. I did all I could do. If he lives, he lives. If he dies, he dies. But he didn't know that we were praying for him. He didn't know we'd called the United States and the people all over America. We were praying that he'd be healed. And guess what happened? He, he didn't die. He recuperated. And there in intensive care with bandages on his head, our national pastor asked him, only one person could see him. He said, would you like to know if you died, you'd go to heaven? And he says, boy, would I. <laughs> and right there in that hospital room, he got saved. Amen. I mean, I saw a miracle. Amen. And I'm telling you, I know what miracles are because I've seen them. And this book is filled with miracles. Amen. And that's what we're going to do today is talk about a miracle. So we talked here that Jesus was in this town preaching. And what had happened, there were a lot of people that had heard about Jesus. They had heard of his miracles heard about all of his good works, heard about his preaching, and they wanted to go here and preach. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to read the verses in the book of uh, uh, Luke. We're going to get over there in a couple of minutes, and we're going to see who it was that came to hear Jesus preach. All right? And so they were doctors of the law. In fact, let's go there in Luke chapter 5.17. You don't have to turn that off. Just read it if you want. If you want to, you can. In Luke 5.17, it's the same story, but it's a different accounting. In Luke 5.17... And it came to pass that certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So here's the story. They're in this little house. The house is packed. And I, I can't imagine how big it was, but I'll tell you whose house it was. Simon Peter's house. Because the Lord was dealing with Peter, and Peter got excited about Jesus, and he wanted all of his friends to come and hear about Jesus, because there was, there was a curiosity about Jesus. He was healing people. People's lives were being changed. And he was preaching stuff that was new. And so, Peter has this meeting with Jesus, and Jesus is there. And uh, let me turn my page here, and all this place is packed. And in verse 2, here it says, in Mark 2, it says, and straightway many were gathered together inasmuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as, the, uh, as about the door. And he preached the word of God unto them. Now you've got to get the picture here, what's going on. All these learned people, they wanted to come and hear about Jesus, and the place was packed. Now they did, we've got air conditioning today, we've got fans going, as you can see, and it's comfortable in here. It may get a little too cold, I don't know, we crank it up and it can get pretty cold. But it wasn't, they didn't have air conditioning in those days. And they were, they didn't have right guard, left guard, or old spice. They didn't have any deodorant that they were wearing. Who knows if they bathed every day? I don't know. I wasn't there. But I can imagine that there were uh, aromas in the air wafting around in that room. All that was going on. And Jesus was right there teaching them. All right? Now let's see what happened. <clears throat> 
We're going to go over to Luke now, chapter 5, and verse 18. We're going to spend the rest of the time in Luke chapter 5 because I'm trying to pull stuff out of both of these accounts that are good. In Luke chapter 5 and in verse 18, the Bible says, And behold, men brought in a bed, brought in a bed of a man who was taken in with a palsy. All right, now what is a palsy? A palsy is a, uh, it is a nervous system disorder. And what happens is, is that people begin to twitch and they begin to be, they're, they're, they're having pain and they're, it, it, today we have cerebral palsy and there's other, there's all kinds of palsies. And some of these palsies is where there's, there is a, a stroke situation and, and, and their faces change. It's all kinds of strange things going on. And this man had a palsy, the Bible says, and his friends wanted to bring him to Jesus because they knew that Jesus could heal him. Can I stop and say something? The only doctor in this universe that there is is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can heal anybody. And if anybody is healed from any kind of a sickness, it's because Jesus allowed it to happen and was the power behind it happening. Amen. Now, that God, God will use doctors and medicine, and that's all good in its place, even surgery. But I want you to know that it's the Lord that heals people. And Amen. He can still do it today. Amen? And so these four men knew... They had heard about Jesus' testimony. They'd seen His power. And they knew if they could just get their friend to Jesus, they knew that, his, that Jesus would heal them. They knew that. They had faith to believe that. So they brought Him. But there was a little problem. All these people in this house, and let's read verse number 19 of Luke chapter 5, in the first part. And when they could not find by what way they might bring Him in because of the multitude, they did something. They couldn't come through that door. They couldn't come through that door. They couldn't come through that door. The place was packed. And they had a special delivery to make. What was that special delivery? Their friend that was hurt, that had the palsy, that had this disease. And they wanted him healed. And they knew Amen. Jesus could do it. But they had a problem. They couldn't get him to Jesus. They couldn't get him there. They had a real problem. Let's see what happened. All right? Um, but before we see what happened, you know what, folks? It's like that here today. There are people in this city, within walking distance of our church here, that are hurting spiritually. And because of that spiritual hurt, they're hurting physically. I'm talking about drug addiction. I'm talking about alcoholism. I'm talking about sexual addi uh, addiction. Now, we're going to remember the old timers. There was a lady that came here to visit. She'd heard about our church. I'd met her on the street. I'm not going to give your name. And I hope you forgot her name. I forgot. I haven't forgotten it, but I remember what happened. I've been inviting her to come. I invite people everywhere to come to this church. And she drove by, and she came up. She came in the front door, and she looked, and she started talking. And you know what she talked about? She talked about sexual addiction and all kinds of sexual strange things. And I'm thinking, what's going on with this person? And it dawned on me, she's got a problem. That's why she brought it up. Because when you talk about things, that's what's on your heart. Because out of the abundance, the heart, the mouth, the speaking, you know, that's what Jesus said. Amen? She had a problem. And I, can't, I wonder how many other problems have other people have problems in our world here in, in walking distance of this place. And, but I know this. The Lord can heal and the Lord can, can change people's lives Amen. and make their lives better. And these men knew that they, but we got to remember that we too have the same problem. We, need, we have people that need to get in here to hear the teaching and the preaching of God's word. Now let's see what they did. Verses 8, uh, let me read verse 19 again. And when they could not find by, by which way they would bring him in because of the multitude, they went to the housetop on the roof and let him down through the tiling with his couch in the midst of Jesus. They, they, in other words, they went up on top of the building. They took out all the tiles that were up there. Now you've got to remember in those days, the buildings were simple, okay? And I, in South America, when I was living down there, we had tile roofs. It's cheap, but you know what? Tiles, are, they have two characteristics. They're fragile and they're heavy. Cement tiles. I mean, they are heavy. And I often wonder what people do when there's an earthquake. And all those tons of tiles are on that roof, literally. And I had been up on the roof trying to fix something. And, and you have to walk, be careful, because I'm not exactly a small person, and I'm telling you, I step on one of those things, crack, there it goes, oh, i got to replace that, crack, got to replace that. One. So I got a real skinny guy to go up there and do the work, you know, because I finally got wise after a while. But these guys, these guys got up there on the roof, 
and they took the tiles back where Jesus, right over where Jesus was, and then they, what did they do? They dropped him on his stretcher down. They had four pieces of rope, and they lowered him down through the roof, right down to where Jesus was. Now, I want to tell you something. It's never happened before, and it's never, it never happened again. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Now, how would you feel today, and we're here preaching, and I'm talking all of a sudden, and all of a sudden that piece of the roof comes off, and there's four guys on the roof, and they want to put a guy down there and say, this guy's hurting, and we need, we need you to pray that he gets healed. Would, you know what you'd be doing? And I'd be doing it too. You'd be like this, looking at what's going on here. What's going on? Everybody was looking. And you know what's so funny about this story? Nobody remembers what the sermon was that day. It's not recorded. Nobody remembers exactly the names of who was there. They just remember there were four guys in the roof with their buddy on a stretcher, and they were lowering him down to see Jesus so he could get healed. Now what happened? What happened? Let's look at verse number 20. We're getting, close to, we're getting closer to the end here. Verse 20, it says... And when Jesus saw their faith, now notice, he didn't see the faith of the man on the stretcher. He saw the faith of the four men who led him down into the roof, down through the roof. Because they knew, they knew what? They knew that Jesus was healing. That Je they knew Jesus would meet his need. And they took their friend and put him down. And the Bible says in verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, what did he say to the man in verse 20? He said, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. But wait a minute, wait a minute. He's supposed to be healed physically. Guess what? When Jesus dealt with somebody, he saved them first, and then he healed them. Because the greatest miracle that Jesus can do for any person is to save them. That's number one. Because you know what? When you die, you die. People come and go, and they die. And we're, we're all, we've all got an appointment with the undertaker. Amen. If the, if the Lord Amen. Carries. And that's going to happen. It'll happen to me. It'll happen to you. But I'm telling you today, the greatest miracle that the Lord can do for you and for me is to save us. And the Lord saved them. I like that. And you know what happened? He saw their faith. In, now notice, what did these four men do? He, Jesus said he noticed their faith. Well, let me tell you what their faith did. First of all, they saw the need of the man. They saw his need. That was, that was number one. Secondly, they brought their friend to where Jesus was. That's very important. And you know what we're trying to do today? We're trying to bring people to Jesus. Then thirdly, they did, they couldn't get into Jesus the normal way, so they thought outside the box. They thought outside the box and they improvised and they came up with a solution. Alright? Now let's let's talk about here in Stephenville. We might have a hamburger day someday and give out free hamburgers to everybody that comes, thinking outside of the box to get people here. We could do that, couldn't we? Sure we could. Amen. we got to think outside the box like these four guys did. They analyzed the problem. They said, what are we going to do? Let's go up on the roof. We'll let them down through the roof. And then notice the next thing that happened about their faith. They all four got involved. You know what? Sometimes we say in the church, well, let Brother Ron do it. Or let Brother Ron and Bruce or Brother, Brother Ron and Burl do it. You know, that's okay. Let them do it. Or, or maybe Dottie. We'll let her do something. Whatever. You know, but guess what? They all got involved and they all worked together and they shared the responsibility. That was their faith that they had. And you know what? They, they, they made a plan. They used their noodle. They all worked together. That talks about unity. They were faithfully working until the goal was reached. That's Amen. something else that's important. They didn't give up. Now I want to say something about our church. We're here about eight months plus, eight, between eight and nine months. And I don't want to quit. I don't want to throw in the towel. And if it's just me, me and Lee and, and my wife, I'm here. Because I'm preaching the Word of God. I want people to get saved. And I have a message to preach. And I, and I believe God's blessing it. And you folks are here as part of the blessing of that. Amen. Coming here to hear us. Thank you for coming today. Praise God. Amen. But folks, listen. These guys were determined that they were going to quit till their friend got to Jesus. They were persistent. And they didn't give him the towel and they didn't quit. And I like that about them. You know, these are good characteristics of a church, amen? That you just get a vision, you know what you're going to do, you have a plan, you work together, and you don't quit, you get the job done. Boy, that's good preaching. I like that. Amen. And then, and then notice they won the victory, and he got healed, and he got uh, saved, and he got healed. Now, how does this apply to us today? 
A little bit later, if you read the rest of the story, there was a big argument about should Jesus be healing on the Sabbath and all this religious talk that was going on. It doesn't really have anything to do with us in the story because we're going to make the application to us here today. All right, how does this apply to us? Now, I have been in the ministry almost my entire adult life, and I will tell you this. When I was in South America, we used to have a tent, and we one time we got my tent and another missionary's tent and put them together, and we averaged over 350 to 400 people every night for a week. We brought in a preacher from Mexico, Enoch Gutierrez, and that man, could, he's a preaching machine. We had 84 people make a decision. They came forward, we dealt with them at the altar, and they made a, a decision to trust Christ as their personal Savior. We were on cloud nine. Do you know how many of those people we got in our church after the meeting is over? Zero. Zero. And you know why? Because it's important that people that get saved identify that decision with a place where the Word of God is preached and taught every week. It's very, very important. Conversely, we preached, we would have meetings in our church, we would have meetings, we would have our regular services, and every time somebody got saved, they probably would get baptized. We had a portable baptistry. By the way, that was just making me prepared to come here and preach in Stephenville, all that. Amen? <laughs> so anyway, they'd get saved, they'd get baptized, and then guess what? They stuck. They stayed. And I'm still friends with them on Facebook, and that's why I started the, the Spanish uh, Facebook page, the Casilla Bautista de Tejas. Because they want to hear me preach. I said, okay, I don't know how good it is. It's probably like cornbread and beans, but that's okay. I don't care. <laughs> but folks, listen to me today. I learned a long time ago that we can go out and have meetings and we can win people, Lord, but it's better to win them right here in this place or where we're going to be because they can associate that decision with the teaching and preaching of God's Word and God's people and God's music and all that goes on. It's very important. And they brought him to where Jesus was. Very, very important. Secondly, we must realize that we need to be excited. Now, I'm pretty, pretty an excited person. You, you know me long enough that you know I kind of get, get excited. And I'm, that's, that's how I'm wired. But I will tell you this, that if a church will get excited, they can catch that excitement and they can transfer that to the work and get other people excited about coming. You know what? Anything in life that, where there's excitement is always success. Have you ever noticed that? You ever notice the championship baseball, basketball, or football team? They've got that excitement. They've got that moxie. They've got that, 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 that element. What makes Texas A&M so great? They've got the 12th man. You know what the 12th man is? You all know what the 12th man is? That's all the people in the stands screaming for them. They don't sit at Texas A&M Stadium football. They all stand the whole game. Did you know that? The whole game. Good night. I want my money back if I bought a ticket down there. I want to see if I'm going to buy a ticket, right? So excitement is very important, all right? And then what else? you got to think outside the box. And we're going to be doing that, and you got to not quit. Now, here's what happened. They got excited, those four guys. The Lord saw their faith, and their friend got healed. You know what? we got to get excited about helping our friends and neighbors and family folks get saved. It's so important. And if we don't do it, we may miss a great opportunity. That God has laid before us. You say, well, you know what? I can get a sermon in any church. Yeah, you can. You, you really can. I can sing songs in another church. Yeah, you can. I can even get a church building in another church. Yeah, you can. But what's going on in that church? That's my question. What's going on there? Because I want our church to be the most spiritual church in town. That's what I want. I want people to say, I got to that church, and I got preached to, and I got taught, and I sang, and it was good to be in that church, and I'm coming back because that's I want to be a part of what's going on. You know, it's kind of like a train's coming through town, and if you want to go where that train's going, you need to get aboard. you got to get on and get with it. And some of you have, and I hope you folks feel that way down the road, and hope you become a part of us here. But anyway, today we got this story about Jesus and how he healed this man. Why? Not because he couldn't heal him, but because four men got involved personally in getting their friend to Jesus. And they want to ask you, are you involved in getting other people to Jesus? Are you excited about what Jesus means to you so that other people can know the Lord and, and have what you have. 
You know, I think sometimes if we don't tell people about Jesus, if we're not witnesses, and I didn't say a soul winner. I said, you know the witnesses? They say, God bless you. Hope you come to church. Tell me, let me tell you about our church. There's two things. Witnessing is just telling people a little bit about Jesus. And soul winning is leading someone to Christ. They're two different things. And the Lord said, ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and unto the othermost parts of the earth. Acts 1.8. So are we witnesses? God wants us to be a witness. So you know what? I'm excited about our church. I'm excited about what's happening. I know God wants to bless us. And so I want us to be in a position where we can say, Lord, here we are. We need you, Lord, to take care of us and to help us to win people to you. And as I said, in, in our, and you see our webpage, our mission is the Great Commission, to go win people to Christ, to get them baptized, and then to disciple them in the Lord so that they can do like what we're doing, to help people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. How about you today? Are you involved in, are you involved in God's work, doing it God's way? I hope so. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed just for a minute before we pray. And I just want to ask this question today. How many can say, Brother Ron, I know that I'm saved and I want to raise my hand and let you know, Brother Ron, that I know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. If you could say that, would you be willing to lift your hand up and say, I know that I'm saved. God bless you. All right. Now, how many can say, Brother Ron, I know that I'm saved, but you know what? I'm just not as involved personally in helping people come to Jesus and getting involved in helping them come to Jesus as I could be or as I ought to be. And I'd ask you, Pastor, to pray for me that I'd get my heart changed and I'd get uh, excited about telling people about Jesus, get excited about witnessing, get excited about Glory Bound Baptist Church. Brother Ron, would you pray for me today as we finish out the service? Is there one who could raise a hand and say, Brother Ron, pray for me? that I would have this desire to help people come to a saving knowledge of Christ and do my part. God bless you. And someone else today, pray for me, Brother Ron. Anybody else? Pray for me. Father God, today we thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this miracle. Lord, we know that you are a miracle God, and there's nothing you can't do. And so, Father, today we know that you love us in spite of us, that you saved us, that you brought us to this place. We pray you bless our church, but Father, help us to do more for you and to serve you with all of our hearts. And Father, I pray today that if anyone needs a special time of prayer, that they would have that prayer with thee and seek your, seek your face and pray unto thee in a, a time of dedication. Lord, we pray that you would add into our church, help it to grow, and help us, Father, to have wisdom about the things that are coming up in the days ahead about our new property. And Father, I pray that you'd supply all the needs and that you'd give us new people. And help us, Father, to love you with all of our hearts. And help us, Father, to put you number one in our lives all day, every day, all week long, not just on Sunday morning. And Father, bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Dottie, you can shut that off.